Exactly. Can you hear me okay? Thanks. So uh, thank you all so much for coming. I'm Michael Clemens. Welcome to uh, CGD. So uh, I grew up in Utah. I spent a lot of time in the Southwest. Out in that beautiful desert, there is a huge city, a couple million people, straddling the U.S.-Mexico border. Uh, people don't always think of it that way, but it's, the, it's really the same city. It's a huge metropolitan area, half of which is uh, Juarez, Chihuahua, on the Mexican side of the border. The other half is called uh, El Paso, Texas. In 2010, on the Mexican side, there were 3,740 homicides, just in Juarez. Uh, in El Paso, there were two, same year. And that incredible number, those incredible numbers, say a few things to me. Uh, they illustrate the, the carnage of what's been going on down there. Uh, they illustrate uh, the mystery of it. I don't think anybody really understands why, uh, fully, why that happened three years before the, the two parts of the city had similar homicide rates. And they also illustrate how easy it is to ignore uh, if you're on the right side of the fence. So sadly, Latin America is the most violent region on Earth. If you look on the UN list of the top 10 homicide rates on Earth, eight of the top 10 are Latin America and Caribbean. You are more likely to be murdered in Honduras and Venezuela by 10 times than you are to be murdered in Iraq or Afghanistan. Um, when, when I lived in Colombia, people used to say, Colombia se derrumba y nosotros derrumba, which is a rhyming way to say, while we're partying, Colombia's falling apart. The UN estimates that a third of those homicides are related to organized crime, whereas less than 1% are related to organized crime in Asia, Europe, and Oceania. Very particular kind of homicide going on. Now, this is a, a threat to US interests, full stop and not just because of the controversy about children coming across the border that has been filling the headlines this summer uh, in much bigger ways. The US and Latin America are critical partners. So Mexico is the number two purchaser of US exports. Uh, of all US goods exports, a quarter are bought every year by Latin America. A, a stable and prosperous Latin America is in the interest of the US. And for that reason, I, I think it is in the enlightened self-interest of the US to adopt policies that address violence on the other side of the fence. Problem, there's no consensus about exactly how to do that. Um, and we know a lot more about the direct effects of US policy, like acres of coca eradicated, than we know about indirect effects. Lots of controversy about it, lot, very politicized. Um, what we wanted to do is uh, bring, bring you uh, some of the top academic researchers and top policymakers talking about this subject. So academic researchers are learning a lot about the very questions I'm posing. And we created a study group, it's called Beyond the Fence, to connect them with each other and with US policymakers. Uh, this is the first uh, of a few public events of Beyond the Fence uh, at the a website, which is not so visible here, but over there, cgdev.org slash beyond the fence, you can learn about some of the research we've commissioned, some of uh, the future events, and uh, follow us on Twitter, in two languages, by the way. Um, next to me are some of the most knowledgeable people on Earth on this subject, full stop. And I'm just delighted to have all four of you here. Thank you very, very much for coming. I, I want to briefly introduce them and then, uh, and then let them share their knowledge with us. First, closest to me, Daniel Mejia is an associate professor of economics at Colombia's top university, Los Andes. He is the director of the Research Center on Drugs and Security there. He also founded a, a uh, top quality international research network and conference whose name is the best acronym I've ever heard, full stop. It is the America Latina Crime and Policy Network, or Al Capone. <laughs> um, next to him, uh, Peter Reuter is professor of public policy and criminology at <laughs> University of Maryland. He's one of the world's top experts on narcotics policy. He is a senior economist at RAND, where he founded the Drug Policy Research Center. He's also an expert on uh, anti-money laundering policy, among other things. Um, even you, those of you who know this area very well might not know who's sitting next to Peter Reuter, uh, Javier Osorio 
is a rising star in this area. He's an assistant professor of political science at City University of New York in their School of Criminal Justice. He's doing really exciting research using uh, methods from computer science to measure violence in Mexico and beyond in ways that were never possible before. And next to him, uh, finally, Jimmy Story on the right side is at the US State Department. He is the head of the Office of Western Hemisphere Programs for INL, or International Narcotics and Law Enforcement. Before coming to DC, he was running INL's operations in Colombia. Uh, before that, he was uh, a senior civilian representative with the US Armacy in Southeastern Afghanistan, among other appointments. Um, these are four people who really know what they're talking about, and I'm, I'm very uh, excited to, to learn from them today. We want to give 10 minutes to each of them to share some of their knowledge. Then I'm going to claim a few minutes to ask them some questions myself, then offer you guys a chance to ask questions, and we'll wrap up at 2 o'clock. So starting with Daniel. Okay, thank you, Michael, for the for the invitation, not only for, for this event, but for the project as a whole. Uh, when I found out about uh, the event, I was happy to, to share my views. I've always been to share my views with Peter, with uh, Javier. But I was very happy to hear that uh, Jimmy was going to be discussing because I'm going to be sincere here. The U.S. Embassy was completely close to talking to us for many years. But when Jimmy came to the, to the U.S. Embassy, he, he, he found us, he, we met, and we had had a very productive uh, in exchanges of, of ideas, of our research. Maybe we are not some, every time we agree on everything, but, uh, but that's, that's the way uh, discussion should go. So I'm going to focus my remarks today on uh, the direct and collateral, the direct and indirect effects of policies uh, implemented under, under Plan Colombia to reduce the supply of drugs. Plan Colombia, just to give you a brief introduction, uh, for those of you who don't know about it, um, it's a joint strategy between the U.S. and the Colombian government, which was negotiated between 1998 and, and 2000. Uh, and it had two main objectives, to reduce the amount of drugs reaching the U.S. by 50% within a period, period of, initial period of six years, and to improve security conditions. And basically, to, to, to achieve the first objective, uh, there have been different policies that have been implemented, and we can divide these policies into policies aimed at reducing coca cultivation through aerial spraying, manual eradication, and uh, alternative development projects. The other big component of Plan Colombia's interdiction, it has, it has been growing over time, but at the beginning it was very small. And the third has to do, has to do more with this, the carrots of the policies, which is trying to convince farmers to switch from, from the cultivation of, of coca crops into uh, legal crops. So the first, uh, I'm going to focus, I'm going to divide my, my remarks into two. First, I'm going to talk about the direct and collateral effects of aerial spraying, which at the beginning of Plan Colombia, at least for the first seven or eight years of Plan Colombia, aerial spraying was the component which received most of the resources for the military component of Plan Colombia. Uh, just to give you a brief number on this, a small number on the size of, of, Plan Colo of the military component of Plan Colombia, between the U.S. and Colombia during the last 10, 12 years, uh, about $1.2 billion have been spent per year. This is 1.1% of Colombia's GDP. That's, a, in my view, I, I think is the largest intervention ever done in a producer country to reduce the supply of drugs. Just to compare that number, the largest social program in Colombia, which is Familias en Acción, this conditional to cash transfer program, accounts for 0.37% of GDP. So the military, only the military component of Plan Colombia is th almost three times larger than the largest social program of the Colombian government. So let me talk first about the, the effects of aerial spraying. I'm going to be referring to, to a few, the results of, of a few studies. The first one is the direct effects of, of aerial spraying, which is the main objective of aerial spraying is to interrupt the, the cocaine production chain at its very initial stage, which is coca cultivation. Aerial spraying is, is, is carried out by American contractors uh, using a small aircraft and, 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 and herbicides to basically destroy coca crops. Uh, and there, ha there are a few evaluations now out there about the, the, object, the main objective of, of aerial spraying. 
and one that we recently did, which is the, I think the closest that we can get to a, to a randomized experiment, which is a diplomatic friction between the, co the governments of Colombia and Ecuador, where Colombia had to stop fumigations in a 10 kilometer band around the, the border with Ecuador. And that created basically a natural, a, a source of exogenous variation, a natural experiment to evaluate the effects of aerial spraying on coca cultivation. And what we find there is that for each hectare sprayed, coca cultivation is significantly reduced, but the effect is very small. Basically, for each hectare sprayed, coca cultivation is reduced by 0.04 hectares, which, in other words, means that in order to destroy one hectare of land, one hectare with coca cultivation, you have to spray that hectare between 25 and 35 times. That's the, the, the most uh, conservative estimate that we have. If, if we look at the other evidence that we have in the literature, most of the, of the papers say that aerial spraying doesn't have an effect, doesn't have a significant effect on coca cultivation. Ours is the, the only one that finds a significant effect, but the effect is extremely small. The cost to the US and Colombia of, of fumigating one hectare of land with coca is about $2,400. About $800 are paid by the U.S. Embassy, and the rest is paid by Colombia in terms of helicopters that have to go with the spraying crews to protect them from being shot uh, from the ground. Um, and if we take the effectiveness of aerial spraying of 0.04 or 4%, basically what this means is that the cost to Colombia and the U.S. of destroying one hectare with coca crops is about $57,000. To what we compare that number, maybe to the effectiveness of, in, of, of investing these $57,000 in schools or alternative development projects, or that's hard to tell, but uh, this, this is like a cost-benefit analysis where the alternative can be anything. What, what, can, be the, what can be done in, the, in Putumayo or Nariño in, in Colombia with $57,000, and I think that a lot more can be done by investing these resources in other things. The other part of the literature on aerial spraying has to do more with the collateral costs of these policies. There, the literature has, has identified a collateral cost in, in, on the environment, especially when the herbicide, the glyphosate, touches on uh, water sources, on rivers and lakes, and affects the, the amphibian uh, population. Deforestation, there are, there are a couple of papers showing that aerial spraying has an effect, on, has a negative effect on, has a, a, an effect on deforestation. And recently, there have been some studies on the health effects of aerial spraying. Basically, these, the rural populations who live in these areas are not advised in advance that the aerial spraying pro, uh, campaign is going to come up, and they don't have time to protect themselves or prepare, uh, protect the legal crops. Uh, in a paper that we did for the Beyond Defense Project with, uh, with Adriana Camacho, we used the universe of all health consultations in Colombia between 2003 and 2007, that's 52 million observations after we clean the data. And we merge that data set with the daily levels of aerial spraying at the municipal level. And what we find is that aerial spraying campaigns have a negative effect on health outcomes. And specifically, they have a, an effect on dermatological problems and miscarriages. We don't find any effect of aerial spraying on, a, on respiratory problems, as the medical literature has identified. We don't see anything in the data, maybe because the window between the exposition to the herbicide and the time when the symptoms appear is not that clear as it is with dermatological problems or with uh, miscarriages. Um, and there are other, other effects that have been identified. In my view, uh, that, that's a personal view, I think the health, the negative health effects of, this, of spraying with the glyphosate are the, the strongest ones and the ones that we should worry about uh, the most. Let me, in, in the two minutes that I have, let me talk about the other uh, component of Plan Colombia, which is interdiction. Interdiction, we have a lot less studies on the effectiveness of, of interdiction in reducing both coca cultivation and cocaine production. But what we have, it's just a couple of studies, show that interdiction is a lot more effective than eradication is, er manual and or aerial eradication in decreasing the amount of coca cultivation and cocaine production. Basically because it targets a much more important uh, part of the production chain. And there are no documented collateral effects, negative collateral effects of interdiction policies. There never uh, a guy in a, in a fast go boat has claimed that his human rights were violated or his health was damaged because he was interdicted two tons of cocaine. <laughs> and, but, <laughs> some maybe. 
but the effects have been a lot more, uh, it's been a lot more productive in reducing the amount of coca cultivation. In a recent, in the second paper that we did for the Beyond the Friends project, we basically take uh, the data on interdiction efforts in Colombia, and we try to study how interdiction in Colombia has affected the level of drug trafficking and violence in Mexico. And what we have, we have monthly data on, on interdiction in co cocaine seizures in Colombia at the municipal level, and we have the municipal level homicides and, and all the other measures of violence in Mexico. And what we find is that a larger and more frequent seizures of cocaine in Colombia have had an effect on the levels of violence in Mexico, especially in the north part of Mexico. And in the north part is where municipalities have a comparative advantage for the drug trade. Uh, the numbers are not extremely large. Our, the cocaine seizures in Colombia do not explain the majority of, uh, of drug-related violence in Colombia. But what we find is that, on average, larger and more frequent interdiction seizures of cocaine in Colombia can explain about 14% of the rise of, vi of violence in Mexico between 2006 and 2010. And it, they can explain, the seizures in Colombia, cocaine seizures in Colombia, can explain up to 25% of the rise of violence in the north part of Mexico, where actually is the only region in Mexico that has seen the, the violence increase. That's, that's the region where we have seen most of the, of the problems in Mexico. So all in all, basically what this paper does, in, in a sense, uh, Peter will correct me if I'm wrong, I, in, I, as far as I know, this is the first at formal attempt to measure what we call in the drug policy academic literature, the ballooning effects, or what criminologists call displacement effects. That is by pushing the problem in one country, you might be successful in, in pushing it out of, of some region, but you, are on, you end up only displacing the problem somewhere else. Uh, and I think this is the first formal attempt. I think Peter is working on a different project in, 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 in another Central, in Central America. Um, and it shows basically uh, with the numbers and with statistics and formal uh, methods that actually the ballooning effects uh, are there in the data. Um, I think taking together the, the, the few studies that I've been able to, to summarize in these remarks show that uh, there are some programs or things that are done in, the, in, in, in Latin America that do not work, such as aerial spraying and have a huge collateral cost. There are some things that work at the local level but end up only displacing the problem somewhere else. And we should rethink about, we should rethink the policy that we implement to fight against drug trafficking. Maybe, as just to, to finish, we should focus on reducing violence and not reducing the flow of drugs. And that's going to be much more productive for Latin America than than just reducing the flow of drugs. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, this, this session is about unintended consequences, and I think we're focusing particularly on unintended consequences of US policies in uh, Latin America. And that fits into the general debate about drug policy because that's largely a debate about the importance of unintended consequences. What's most salient about the drug problem are not the direct effects of drugs themselves, but the effects of the policies that have been used to control them. We have large black markets. We have blood-borne diseases as a result of needle sharing, which is not the drug itself, it is the conditions that we have created. And we have a vast amount of drug-related crime. All of those are the results of the policies we have chosen. That does not mean that those are bad policy choices because what we can't measure are the extent to which they reduce other aspects of the drug problem, how much it's reduced prevalence, how much it's reduced addiction, et cetera. But my point is simply that we're talking about unintended consequences, which is central to the discussion of drug policy generally. And the US drug policy does have drug choices, really have important unintended consequences for Latin America. And these are, for the first time, I think, starting to enter into debates about policy choices um, in the US uh, itself. I mean, I think that the the homicides in Mexico are seen as 
a consequence of the US market, not necessarily of the US choices, but the US um, market, and vaguely sort of seen as a problem for which the US has to provide some, some response. And the US is only heavily involved as um, in, in uh, drug policy in, in Mexico, Central America, and Colombia. Plan Colombia was by far the largest such intervention, but even now, uh, the State Department spends about $700 million on uh, Latin American uh, drug programs, um, roughly. Um, and um, that doesn't include the substantial expenditures by DEA, Customs and Border Patrol, the Navy, et cetera, who are all active, active in the region. And I sort of want to just touch briefly on some analytic issues. Um, Danielle referred to the fact that uh, a, a concern with any kind of drug enforcement is displacement. And you have displacement across countries. That's just geographic displacement, of course. There's other kinds of displacement as to the, the kind of activity that occurs, who is doing it, et cetera. But we'll just stick with the geographic at the moment. It can be displacement across countries, or it can be displacement within countries. Tough enforcement may drive uh, uh, farmers to grow coca in more remote areas. And I'm going to stick with coca as the, the example. And Indeed, in dealings with Latin America, that is the principal, uh, the drug of almost exclusive concern. So one mechanism is just displaced, geographic displacement. Another mechanism by which unintended consequences occur is how participants adapt to tougher enforcement. They can adapt by corrupting government authorities or by use of violence, either for against a variety of participants. So we have two mechanisms, displacement and adaptation by participants. And I'll talk about two classes of harms which both came up in, in Danielle's talk. One is environmental harms. I want to talk about that sort of more analytically and not in, talk about uh, specific just specific instances. We'll start by noting that coca growing is considered to be uh, ecologically harmful, uh, depletes the soil in various ways. The clearing that goes with it is, is problematic. And the other kind of harm that I'll talk about and I know much more about is, is the violence, in particular uh, violence uh, both against subordinates, tougher enforcement, you have more potential informants, more likely to use violence against uh, subordinates who are potential informants against you, uh, you have violence against other dealers and traffickers, which also is likely to increase with tougher enforcement because it's harder to maintain the, uh, a set of stable relationships if leaders keep being removed. And then you have violence against p police, military, and other officials. So, so we'll talk about environmental harms and the harms related to, to violence. Eradication increases the acreage devoted to production. So the whole purpose of eradication is, of course, to limit production but the adaptation is to grow more, plant more acres in order to produce one acre of, of land. So as um, Daniel suggested, it has a, spraying has a very small consequence in terms of reducing final output. It does, however, increase the amount of land devoted to cocoa production, which is itself a harm. Um, and the shifting from Colombia now to Peru and Bolivia, of course, again exposes new areas to exactly this, this kind of ecological damage. So we have increased damage within the country itself, within Colombia, and then we have increased damage that comes from shifting production from traditional areas in Colombia to new areas in, um, in Peru, and to a lesser extent, extent Bolivia. But what I really want to focus on is, is interdiction. And oddly enough, interdiction, Daniel made a sort of just passing reference to this. Interdiction, that is the effort to seize drugs and couriers on their way from the, you know, from the Andes to, to here, um, increases export demand. 
increases production. Why is that? Because it has two effects. One is it may increase price. Let's grant that it does increase price, and that will reduce consumption. But there's a second effect, which is if you're seizing instead of 20%, you're seizing 40% of the cocaine that's shipped, more cocaine has to be shipped to get one kilo of cocaine to the final market. And that second effect is, under any set of reasonable assumptions, much larger than the first effect. So the consequence of increased interdiction is to actually increase the export demand. It may be good for the US, not good for the producer countries. A point that's sort of been around in the literature for 25 years now, literally, and just never gets articulated, but I think it's actually a rather important effect um, that's worth considering, as indeed I think all these unintended consequences are, but that one you know, I think is an easy target. The other kind of concern we have is, of course, just the shifting of smuggling routes that goes with interdiction. And I want to illustrate with an example that doesn't involve the US. But um, in 2001, um, flights from the Dutch Antilles to Schiphol Airport were full of cocaine couriers. Uh, there were about 1,300 that were arrested that year uh, carrying cocaine. They estimated on not very good basis that, that was just 5% of all the, the uh, couriers that had, had flown there. So the Dutch instituted what I call a very un-Dutch uh, um, program, which is 100% search of passengers boarding the flights in Dutch Antilles. And if they found that you had cocaine with you, up to three kilograms, they confiscated the cocaine, kicked you off the plane, and that was it. Um, one consequence was that a number of charter airlines went out of business. Um, planes were less full than they used to be, but the Dutch got what they wanted, which was a dramatic reduction in um, they only, by the third quarter of 2006, they had only 17 seizures of, um, of cocaine uh, on, on those flights. What happened? The West Africa route opened up. And Guinea-Bissau and Ghana were suddenly routes through which cocaine flowed. It didn't last all that long, but there were about three or four years in which that happened. And that sort of presents you in stark contrast what the choices are here. So we had this relatively harmless route from the Netherlands Antilles to Amsterdam. And Netherlands Antilles, small place, I mean, whatever goes wrong there affects a very small number of people. And it's a middle income country, it's okay. And the Dutch can handle it at the other end. Now instead you have cocaine flowing to Guinea-Bissau and Ghana causing major problems of corruption. Guinea-Bissau is a small country which has major problems of corruption. Before the cocaine, they definitely got substantially worse. Ghana, this was really a, a, a new problem. Was the world better off as a result of that displacement? What that brings to the fore is the fact that the US is devoted to encouraging countries to crack down on wherever the drug traffic currently is. Drug traffic is, I think we generally agree now, not universally, generally agree, unpreventable. Our choices are simply where it will take place. That's also true with production. And so what we should think about is whether a particular route is likely to be better or worse than the alternative to which it will move. Now, hard job to predict that, but I think that it raises uh, an important uh, issue that has not been on the policy agenda. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we live in a hyper numerical uh, world. Numbers matter a lot in policy and in the academia. 
Uh, numbers are good for uh, addressing the relevance of some issues. Like, for example, this problem is raising 100% as compared with last year. That can be said with drug violence, uh, the flow of drugs. So, money are, uh, so uh, numbers are very important in attracting the attention of policymakers. Also, numbers sometimes are used uh, to also call the attention of some very specific issues that need to be addressed. And that is a very big concern for both the policy and, and the academic world. But when it comes to data on drug violence, crime, uh, all those numbers evaporate. We don't have that many good databases. Those databases are usually subject of manipulation from government agencies because they have their own interests in competing for, uh, for budgets uh, or also for hiding some numbers. So we don't have very good numbers of the data that is available. Uh, and that is one of the key problems that we eventually face in doing research that is trying to inform policymakers of the consequences of some policies, drug-related policies. It's not that much of, of the harm that drugs uh, cause themselves, but most importantly, what are the, the consequences that uh, 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 Daniel and, and Peter have been discussing? What are the consequences of these policies? And if we don't have the data, it's very hard to tell if we have been, so if we have been successful in addressing some of these issues with these right policies, uh, we can also have a hard time in allocating some resources for education instead of for fighting drugs, as Daniel mentioned. So it's very hard to tell if you don't have the numbers. And this is one of the uh, challenges I faced when I was doing my research on drug violence in Mexico. In 2007, you saw the very sharp increase of violence, but there were no data that, databases about that. The few data that the government was offering uh, is becoming increasingly opaque, opaque, more aggregated. Now they just publish it on PDF formats uh, that is very hard to use uh, for any kind of analysis. So uh, how do you uh, try to tackle this huge problem without having the data? Um, one of the solutions that I um, approach this is, well, I try to use some software of um, uh, event coding that basically reads newspapers. Uh, that is already a software that exists in the US to, that reads in English. And when I tried to start coding newspapers in Spanish, of course, it didn't work. Because, I mean, it's a different language, right? You cannot ask something that you cannot provide. Uh, so I developed a software basically replicating this um, effort that has been proven successful in the US for starting an international a conflict to start reading newspapers in Spanish. Um, if the government is not providing the data, well, let's ask newspapers about it. Of course, there's always a problem in what you read is what you get. If you just read one newspaper, you might get a little bit of bias because of the specific regional approach of this uh, newspaper. In my case, I use uh, 105 different uh, information sources from government agencies at the federal, local level, also newspapers at the national level, but also at the state level, at least one uh, newspaper for every state. Um, as uh, Daniel mentioned, some of the data available in, in Mexico only starts in 2007. If you want to study what happened before, there's no data. Well, that was a problem for me too, and for everybody trying to assess this in, 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 a, in a quantitative uh, perspective. So I started coding from 2000. That gave me like at, at least from 2000 to 2010, good 11 years of, of data from many different sources to start creating this database on, on drug violence. Um, and this is one of the very important advantages of using new technologies to gather all the information that is out there, dispersed, unconnected, that eventually you have to put the added value of getting all that information, make it systematic, and try to analyze the data in a more rigorous way. So um, with this uh, software, I developed a large end database coding all the municipalities in the country on a daily basis on different types of violence conducted by criminal organizations against each other. That's one kind of violence. Also violence conducted from criminals against government authorities. That's a different kind of violence. And also the many different types of tactics, security policies that government agencies are implementing against criminal organizations. Those have to do with a violent crackdowns against criminals, but also arrests, seizures of drugs, assets, um, um, drugs, assets, and, and guns and weapons. So there are many policies that government officials implement in cracking down these uh, criminal groups. If we don't have the data, how can we evaluate how effective they are? Um, so this is one of the, uh, the contributions of the database that eventually managed to create daily level 
uh, data at the municipal level on many different types of violence, many different types of behavior of violence among criminals against the state, the state fighting criminals. So violence has many different dimensions. It's very dynamic. It evolves uh, quite a lot. And this fine grade data came out of about like 9.8 million observations that allows to have a lot more learning and leverage from these very fine grain data. Uh, one of the uh, key elements that I've been able to uh, find uh, with this data, so it's not only, okay, we have good data, now what do we do with it, uh, is to realize that a lot of uh, the dynamics of violence have to do with the interactive strategic approaches of different uh, parties. We have to go beyond the conception of an homogeneous criminal organization is better to breaking down in different types of criminal organizations. We have to break them down in the different types of violence they engage. And they not only engage and get, uh, uh, against each other, but also they gain, engage with the government. And the government has a big impact in the dynamics of violence. So um, when you try to explain the huge escalation of violence in some areas, um, could you please show the video that I have? Um, I mean, I want to show you some different dynamics of violence that eventually uh, it's, it's puzzling how violence increases in some areas and how violence uh, remains low in some other areas and then it disperses. Um, is it gonna come out in a minute? Oh, no. People can see on the, on the other screen. Okay. There. So you can see the escalation of violence. Sometimes it's not only the escalation, but the diffusion of violence uh, that especially spikes on in 2007 and keeps rising, rising, rising until 2010 where I stopped coding. So uh, you're gonna see the North getting very violent, also the East Coast where it's like the area of uh, reception of, 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 viol of uh, shipments. Also Michoacan, Jalisco, this area now uh, very affected by uh, not only criminal violence but also by vigilante groups. So these are one of the consequences that uh, law enforcement actions Trigger, trigger a lot of violence among criminal organizations. Actually, the more violent the government efforts are, are gonna create a lot more violence against criminal groups. The effect of law enforcement is by large uh, more substantial than non-violent law enforcement like arrests, seizures of drugs, assets, and, and, and guns. So if the government has to decide what strategy to use, the more harmful, uh, harmful one is the one of using violence against criminals. If you want to crack them down, well, try to arrest them without killing them because that's gonna trigger many different interactions of violence. A part of my research also analyzes how these dynamics interactions between government officials and, and, um, and criminal groups not only generate violence within a municipality, but how violence is contagious to other municipalities. The number of clusters of violence have been increasing in terms of numbers, but also how contagious they are uh, it's also increasing. So there are more cl clusters of violence that are being more uh, damaging to the environment or to the neighborhoods around them. So there's violence in one community that, that is affecting now, yes. due to law enforcement in that community, is affecting all the neighborhood around that area. So these are other types, types of, of, of uh, learning that we can get from having fine grained data. Of course, this is not perfect. There might be definitely limitations with the data, but this is the best we can do having developing uh, new uh, technologies to harvest all the information that is out there. You have thousands of journalists reporting events uh, in a very dispersed and fragmented way. If you put all that information together, you can learn something and especially try to assess more detailed impact of the different government policies. What is the effect that those policies are having on criminal violence against each other and how these uh, policies eventually create some more violence against uh, po uh, criminal groups, but in neighboring areas. Um, and that's it, I think I'm on time. Thank you. Well, first I'd like to start off just by thanking you all for the opportunity to be here with such an august group of folks. Um, considering that I went to public schools in South Carolina, the fact that I'm sitting here talking about these issues today is just an absolute miracle. Um, and and uh, I really don't even know where to begin to some, to some extent. The topic is absolutely fascinating. And as a pseudo-economist with the State Department, um, as an econ officer, you know, not somebody who came in just to do uh, counter-narcotics, looking at all these issues of displacement, 
uh, looking at how policies themselves are displaced. I mean, we, we make policy decisions, recommendations based on where we can do things um, oftentimes. And some, sometimes those policies aren't the, actually the best policies or the policies that we'd most want to go after. Uh, so as I, as, as I look at this, um, it is, again, absolutely fascinating and, and such, a, such a rich, rich, rich topic to look at. And I want to give you a little bit of perspective. I don't want to make this a Columbia-only conversation. I want to move out of that a little bit. Uh, you know, Daniel and I have known each other for years, and thank you very much for your comments. And, and um, we're in violent agreement on many things, and, and we disagree vehemently on others. I, I disagree completely on, um, uh, on the environmental impact of glyphosate and the health issues and so, so forth and so, and, uh, on those particular issues. I also would say, and, and I have some maps as well, that that we have seen a huge impact from the use of aerial eradication in Colombia. Now the question whether or not that's the best use of our resources on this, I think we're in, we're in some agreement. We need to look at that as a policy decision. Um, I can say since 2007, it's a 50% reduction in coca cultivation in Colombia. And I can also say that it's about a 60% increase in coca production where I'm not allowed to aerial eradicate. So the question that Peter raised as well, this is an important one. Well, are we, are we causing harm? Uh, by pushing it into areas where we can't do aerial eradication? That's a very good question. It's a very important question. But going back to policy displacement, um, it, it, is it, if it's, if it's uh, easier to get after coca where we know it is, um, rather than doing interdiction? For instance, to let you know how this works, you might have, you might have four or 5,000, uh, perhaps as many as nine, 10,000 producers of coca leaf in the country. You may have three or 4,000 base labs in the country. You may have 300, 400 uh, HCL labs. If I knew where every HCL lab was in the country, and I think on this we're in very much agreement, I would go after those HCL labs. That's what actually makes cocaine, and that would have a huge impact on the drug trafficking organizations, very minimal, minimal impact on the, uh, on the campesinos that are engaged in, the, in, in, in actually growing coca leaf. I think that would get after this, this issue in, in a very robust and, and good way. Um, but I also agree that, that we can't just, you know, we can't just have a one-sided policy here. And what we've t attempted to do, not only in Colombia but, but elsewhere, is look at this much more holistically. A lot of folks look at INL, we used to be called drugs and thugs back in the day, and, um, and, and really and truly 28 percent of our, of our budget is focused on counter-narcotics, which tells me that the vast majority of it is looking at institutions. Uh, the balloon effect is something that I, I know everybody uses that term. I've tried to come up with something else, another term of art, but I'm not particularly bright. I've come up with a sandcastle effect. doesn't work. Um, I think in my situation, it's whack-a-mole. Whack-a-mole. Uh, that one. That, 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 yeah, that, 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 that one maybe. But the fact of the matter is that organizations that, that are engaged in these types of illicit activities go where they, where they can do their work most, easy, most, uh, most, most readily. So when you look at a place, for instance, in Central America, where's the weakest institutions? I would submit Honduras, um, and we've seen Honduras be ground zero uh, for the for the effects that we've had actually in Mexico, where we've had some good impact on tra on going after some of the larger organizations, Chapo Guzman and others among them, right? So as we've had an impact in Colombia, uh, the production has moved. As we've and also they haven't had the ability to we've taken out large organizations haven't had the ability. Uh, to transport the drugs up. As we've worked with the Mexicans through the Merida Initiative, that subsequently has moved down to Central America. And ladies and gentlemen, over the last three years, I've seen a doubling twice of the amount of cocaine going through the Caribbean. I don't know how many of you are old enough to remember not wearing socks and having white jackets, uh, but if you uh, remember your Miami Vice days, I know Adam does, take it out of the closet, Adam. Or unfortunately, we're getting back there. I mean, I think we're all going to be doing this again. Uh, we've seen it go from 3% of total flow to 8% of total flow to 14% of total flow. Uh, so it's, it, it's something that we have, to take, we have to take a look at. You know, as I, as I looked at the topics that we were going to cover today, I wanted to kind of touch a little bit upon that which, that what we're doing currently. Um, and maybe, maybe talk a little bit again about Columbia. I couldn't agree more. I think that just having a, a hard right side approach is wrong. You know, we have to be able to do much more than that. In Peru, Eradication and alternative development together have worked very well. When I was, la when I was first in Peru in the early 90s in the upper Huallaga Valley, you couldn't go. It was completely off limits to everyone. Today, it's 100% open. Uh, we have cacao being grown. There's no coca there. All the coca has moved into the vrime. Now we have to do the same thing in the vrime, right? We have to, we're, we're playing whack-a-mole. Perhaps, perhaps we are. 
Um, but the fact of the matter is the government itself in Peru, which is something the government of Colombia has been unable to do, frankly, they built roads into the upper Huayaga Valley. They came in with additional, uh, additional uh, government services, provided government services. We worked hand in hand with them in Peru, and we've had an effect where we've had an effect. I mean, what we'd like to do is have an effect everywhere, all the time, at the same time. It's very difficult. Even as much money as we've spent, we don't have enough to, to get after that, that particular problem set. In the context of Colombia, especially as we look at the peace accords, um, how this will be approached, um, how the government's going to do the – frankly, I think there's a silver bullet in Colombia's infrastructure. It's roads. It's roads. Um, how uh, they're going to do that um, and how they're going to get education – uh, out to some of these areas, healthcare will be very tough. I'll give you some examples on the other side of the equation. We convinced a local community in Colombia uh, to, to, to turn their rechazar, to turn their back on, on coca. They went to cacao, but we didn't have a police presence. Well, last year uh, we attempted to establish police presence and they tortured and mur killed uh, a, a major from the Colombian National Police in a patrullero. So the question there was okay, well, we. We did, the, we did the soft side stuff, but we didn't have any security whatsoever, and that was the result. So these are types of issues that are also, I mean, we have lots of antidotes. How, you know, how, do, how do we get after this? I do think that there have to be three legs to the stool, um, and that's something that currently, even, even today and over the weekend, the president himself will be engaged on. We're, we're developing for Central America a new strategy where we're looking at a Central America that we'd like to be middle class, um, uh, democratic, and secure. And the fact of the matter is our policy so far, the policy prescriptions that we've had have been really focused on the security piece. To some extent, it's the easiest piece to get after. It's, it's rather easy for us to do police training. It's easy to set up a vetted unit. Uh, it's rather easy to work with certain parts of the security services. Much more difficult to integrate Central America based on all sorts of historical issues that they've had uh, to create a market, an integrated market of 43 million people that can, that can actually grow together. That piece is, is just very tough to do. Um, but we are looking at it very closely. I think you'll see next year that, excuse me, next week even, uh, as this strategy gets approved by, again, by the White House, we'll be engaging in Central America in a new way. I mean, we have to think about domestic, in Central American context, in Mexico context, and even with drugs, and we're talking about other places. You know, what impact did the DREAM Act have on unaccompanied minors coming from Central America? What, what impact is the fact that we haven't had a, had a robust discussion of, of domestically of immigration policy? And, and here, ladies and gentlemen, let me be very clear, speaking for myself, um, I, I, I'm not senior enough yet to, have the, uh, uh, to be in a position where I can't speak for myself. Um, but these types of things um, we have to take into consideration also. So as I look at what we're doing in Central America, it's much less focused on counter-narcotics, frankly. It's much less focused on the hard side. It's much more focused on community policing, teaching anti-gang resistance training to youth. I've trained over 20,000 people now in Honduras uh, through the GREAT program, building communities of practice, working with model police precincts. And un but unfortunately, yet again, if I build a model police precinct in Tegucigalpa, I might help the community of San Miguel decrease homicide rates by 25, 30%. What am I doing in San Pedro Zula? Right? What's happening there? So what is the answer? Is the answer that we do, uh, is the answer that, 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 we, uh, that we can't do anything, we, we're in a stasis, is the answer we have to do a little bit of something everywhere and spread the peanut butter real thin, so thin you can't taste it? Um, these are questions that we grapple with every day, and the reason why I like coming to these events is it, it, it always gives us food for thought um, as we sit down and try to figure out how we want to approach our policy. When it comes to drugs, I just, uh, you know, one of the things that I, I really do like to talk about is let's not get trapped into the, well, it's either a prohibitionist model or it's a legalizer model uh, we're really working in between there. And I think that as you, as you listen to our Assistant Secretary, who unfortunately couldn't be here today, you listen to the President of the United States, you, listen to, you, list, you, you look and see how we're adjusting our policies. Um, this is not a 1960s, 1970s policy, drug war policy, don't even use the phrase. What we're looking at is building strong institutions, working with solid partners, and attempting to, do, attempting to, 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 to bust the balloon when it comes to transnational organized criminal networks everywhere, all the time, um, at one time. Very difficult to do. Anyway, thank you very much for, uh, for this and I look forward to the questions. Thank you. Am I on? Can you, uh, can you hear me, you guys? No, it's not on. How about now? 
Yeah. Great. So I want to ask a couple of questions. I see people uh, raring to go. And please just uh, <laughs> uh, uh, hold on for five, 10 minutes. Then we'll, uh, we'll open it up. We'll have till 2 o'clock. We'll have lots of chances to discuss with you guys. I, I first want to say. Uh, I, I just personally deeply appreciate the intellectual engagement that's going on here. I doubt that uh, Jimmy gets a lot of points at work for going and talking to professors. <laughs> and I know that Javier doesn't get points for his tenure package uh, for coming to DC and, and, and talking to us. This is just a, uh, a personal willingness to intellectually engage with a, a fraught issue that I, I it, it's, uh, it's my favorite part of being in DC. And it doesn't happen often. Um, so uh, Jimmy brought up Central America. And uh, on July 26th, the, the Post editorial board wrote a, a, a provocative piece called The Immigration Crisis Solution, colon, A Plan Honduras. Uh, and they, they wrote, among other things, uh, Plan, Colombia. Plan Colombia's results are the best answer to those who would say that nation building is always doomed to fail. Um, Things have advanced since then. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Jimmy already knows, I, I, I'm sure, but can tell us everything about what uh, what the administration is going to do in that area. Um, my question for uh, for for all of you, uh, uh, but uh, uh, feel free to answer or not, is uh, what do you think of a plan Honduras? Uh, if there were to be a Plan Honduras, uh, what could we learn from, from Plan Colombia about, about elements that it should include, elements that it might modify? Uh, uh, are there indirect effects we could uh, expect? And uh, mm -hmm. are there things that we should be doing to uh, uh, anticipate and maybe ameliorate uh, those indirect effects? Thoughts on Central America? I'd, I'd like to open up, if I may, uh, just a couple thoughts. I think y'all can hear me. Um, you know, the thing about Plan Colombia that was so important was that it was really a Colombian plan. The other thing you have to remember is that the Colombians had the political will to take extraordinary measures. Um, the extraordinary measures were there was tax reform, uh, there, uh, there, there was legal reform, um, and also they paid for seven to every dollar, U.S. dollar, there were at least seven Colombian dollars. I think actually that's a low number. I think the number is much higher. It was a Colombian effort. You also had a country with relatively strong institutions that were on the right trajectory. You had a large, diverse economy base, um, it, it, lots of natural resources, so forth and so on. I mean, you, you, there were a lot of things going on there that frankly aren't going on in Honduras right now. You know, Honduras is a country of 7, 10, 11 million people, forgive me, uh, 43 million total in the region, but um, half the country is completely ungoverned space. You know, if you don't know this, this is extraordinary stuff. Half the country, there's nothing going, from Bajo Aguan all the way up to Alancho, Madre Dios. There, there's almost no government presence whatsoever there. Uh, very little military presence, uh, but, but no other government presence. You have relatively weak institutions. You don't have a robust economy. Um, so, you know, we are working very closely with the Honduran government. I think that, that Juan Orlando Hernandez has some good ideas, and we're working very closely with him to, to bring some of those to fruition. I'm sure I'll be traveling back to Honduras within a few weeks to have discussions again with him and his team on how we can approach this. Um, but I'll tell you, it, our approach in Honduras, frankly, and where, where things have been, where, where I think we're going to go and where things have really worked, are on the soft side. Working with NGOs, working with communities, uh, trying to decrease violence. Some of the vetted units have been extraordinary. Um, and, you know, to give you one example and I'll stop, because I could go on about Honduras forever. It takes up about 80% of my bandwidth these days. Uh, because it is such, a, such an issue. Um, there was one drug trafficking organization that was taken down, Los Cachiros, and recently Los Valle, um, uh, Valle I'm, I'm just showing my ignorance all of a sudden, I had a little bit of a blank, but anyway, Los Cachiros organization itself, in one operation, uh, they seized, with some of our support, $800 million worth of assets. So if you go back and see what the GDP of Honduras is, and you look at one drug trafficking organization with $800 million worth of assets that we know about, which were seized, you can look at the relative power vis-a-vis -vis the state that one organization had, one organization, and there are multiple organizations like that in the country. Now, it's not just enough to go after those big organizations. We have to do a lot more on the citizen security piece writ large in the base of the country. And I think the new strategy is going to look at building those institutions, more economic opportunity, and certainly securing, sec securing uh, security for citizens throughout the country. Thoughts on Central America? I mean, I, I, th I think um, that analysis is exactly right. The, 
the differences between Colombia and Honduras are much more striking than the similarities, and you really have to redesign Plan Colombia to work with weak institutions. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I would say that one of the big differences is uh, the type of violence is who's conducting this kind of violence. And it's not the same kind of large criminal organizations that you had in Colombia as in Mexico. In Honduras, is more horizontal, but massive gangs mm -hmm. conducting most of the of this violence. The violence is not these armed commandos clashing in the middle of the street, throwing grenades to one another. It's a lot more homicides based on uh, extraction, on taxing uh, the population. There are predatory organizations against the hosting, uh, the hosting communities. And the way to approach that might not be the same solution as uh, in Colombia or Mexico with most of the funds in Plan Merida, Iniciativa Merida and Plan Colombia came uh, from the military efforts. In Mexico, the, the fourth pillar, which is a focus on, on building stronger communities, as I, if, I, if I'm not wrong, maybe 3% of the budget. Uh, we need to focus a lot more on the social aspects, providing mm -hmm. economic opportunities, education, building institutions, putting a lot more effort on that than on the military aspects of the punitive approach. Mm -hmm. I think focusing on security is the right strategy, and that's what worked in Colombia. Uh, Remember that before Plan Colombia was implemented, more than three, 300 municipalities, which is about 25 to 30 percent of all municipalities, had no presence of the police or the army in Colombia. And recovering these municipalities was extremely important in two dimensions, giving the army and the police intelligence, capabilities, and mobility. Mm -hmm. At the, before Plan Colombia, when a, when, a, when a small town was attacked by FARC, there were no helicopters to move uh, the troops to, to confront the attack. And Plan Colombia gave a lot of mobility and intelligence information that was crucial to change completely the, mm -hmm. the, the conflict in Colombia. So focusing on citizen security and helping Honduras to, to, to confront criminality and violent crime, I think is the right approach. Thank you. So uh, uh, something else that's been on my mind, we, we have focused on US policy in this discussion. That, that's the, the role of CGD uh, fundamentally is to study the effects of rich countries' uh, actions and uh, policy actions and economies on the rest of the world. Uh, however, um, what is the role of, uh, of, uh, of our partners? Uh, what, what do you need from the Honduran government? What, uh, what, could, what could Mexico be doing better? What could the Colombian government be doing better? Yeah. Please. I I've been, I've been extremely critical, as you heard me, of many different policies that have been implemented that can be seen as pushed by the US government. But Colombia has its own faults. Not having built the infrastructure to connect Putumayo with the rest of the country, mm -hmm. not having pres state presence in the broad sense, judges, uh, police, uh, health uh, units, schools, that's a big mistake. And one of the things that, that work, one of the, and Adam has worked on this, uh, we've done also evaluations on the, on a plan that was aimed at uh, recovering a region in Colombia, in the, in the in, in, it's called the Macarena region. That was a, a plan to intervene not only with police and eradication, but with hospitals, uh, bringing judges to these towns, schools, and all, dim all social dimensions improved and coca cultivation went down dramatically there. Mm -hmm. So that works, I mean. And part of the fault is not only the US fault who pushes us to do spraying, it also has to do with Colombia. Why Putumayo has been the region where most coca cultivation takes place in the world for 20 years? Well, because the state has no presence at all in, in Putumayo. And that's part of the, of the Colombian state uh, fault. Yeah, I'm I'm not sure I take it to be well a well-formed question. Um, I'm confident it isn't. <laughs> I mean, the assumption is that the government of Honduras, and we'll just stick with that as an example, though it's probably the extreme, but not much different from El Salvador and Guatemala, um, that the government of Honduras is really a partner. And the government of Honduras is notoriously weak it's been that way well before the drug problem hit Central America. It's gotten weaker relative to its internal um, adversaries. Um, but 
we can identify what the Honduran government should do, but that uh, creates a sort of a, a false entity, which is the Honduran government. Uh, the Hon, you know, Honduras has something that is called the government, but is in fact, uh, by many standards, a, a conspiracy against the general public uh, and uh, not really a partner. Got it. So, I mean, I, I'm, I guess I think our goal should be to do no harm. That <coughs> wrote an article with that hand, right? uh, that title. <coughs> You know, we have worsened their problems with our insatiable demand declining. It's the large demand for drugs. Give them money to do whatever they can do that helps them. Give them some advice. But the notion that we can help them help us, I think, is um, stretching. But I'd like Please. to offer some reflections on that. I can be as colorful as you can be, Peter. Um, but, but. Um, Listen, I, just a couple of data points, and I might move it off of Honduras just a little bit. You know, the Honduran government has made a couple of very difficult decisions lately. So they're showing some political will to do things that, that before now they could, just couldn't do. They just um, just let go 3,000 police officers. Many of these were ghost police officers, but then others they just refused to show to work. 3,000 police officers no longer in the rolls. That's a, that's a good start. And we have a multi-layered approach for working with the Honduran government on their own plan to do police reform writ large. Extraordinarily necessary. Um, so, there, you know, I, I think there's an, ex there's an example of some political will. Some of the other stuff they're doing, they just extradited their first ever Honduran citizen um, a few months ago. That's an important thing because what worked in Colombia was not only helicopters. It was the rewards program. Suddenly you can't get a lunch with somebody if they don't have five million dollars in the bank if you're a bad guy, right? Uh, it was extradition. It was also wiretaps. It was it was police reform in Colombia. I mean, there are lots of things that, that happened in Colombia that that really helped push along change faster than it would have happened otherwise. However, I agree with Daniel on, the, on Danielle on this. You know, you look at the the ability to do consolidation is the government of Colombia is kind of constrained in its ability to do cons what's called consolidation. It's constrained politically because where coke has grown and where they need to consolidate state presence, about 4% of the population live. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you don't really buy a lot of votes doing that, right? Um, and the second is that the government itself is unable, many parts of the ministries, to operate in areas that are considered red. When you have coca and FARC in an area, it's red. Therefore, the Ministry of Education can't really operate there, the Ministry of Transportation, and so forth and so on. Billions of dollars of infrastructure money available to be utilized in Colombia, but can't be. The miracle of the Macarena, 17 kilometers of road. 17 kilometers of road. That's a miracle? I don't think so. Some miraculous things happen in places like the Dominican Republic. They wanted a 911 call center. They put their own money behind it. The citizens were behind it. We put in a little bit of seed capital and some smart people to show them how to do it. And now the country, since May, has completely changed how they, how they interact with their own security services, which I think is, is, is fantastic just as a, a small example. Have you yeah, let me more? take up two steps back and provide a bigger approach, uh, even though I'm very fan of micro-level dynamics. If we look at the history of Latin America throughout the, uh, like, I don't know, 50 years, we can see that the biggest challenge in the region was first authoritarian re regimes. It took a lot of social movements, mm -hmm. leadership from democracy champions to change the entire region. The second problem of the region was the economic crisis in the 80s, hyperinflation, unemployment, what took the solution for the entire region, also building human capital. Governments sent very smart people to get trained abroad, learn how to run the economy. Eventually they came back. Some of them stayed in the US, but many of them stayed back, went back and started working their institutions, building, putting the right system of incentives for everyone from top all the way down. Also seize and support. So this big problem is not only for Honduras, Colombia, or Mexico, it's a regional problem. I don't know actually what the solution is or how it's gonna be implemented in every specific countries, but I think the common trend uh, from the transitions of democracy and also controlling the macroeconomies so, uh, at some certain extent comes from building human capital. And that has to do with uh, learning how to manage these problems of security, violence, which is now the most prevailing problem in, in, in Latin America, throughout Latin America. We need to have a 
people with really good credentials in the security sectors as now we have really good economists running central banks. We need this kind of uh, human capital and then making that sh uh, get infused into institutions and so, so all these things work. Just to Please. point on, sorry, just to point on the economics, I, I found this quite humorous and hopefully you will as well, but at the Wilson Center, they had the three foreign ministers from El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras. And the foreign minister from um, Guatemala said he wanted to come back after being in DC to Guatemala um, and um, publish the Tea Party tax plan in Guatemala, but he said that would make him look like a communist in the country. <laughs> you know, they're, 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 you know, corruption is rampant. Um, there, there's, there, there are very little. The, the state, the state is not receiving very much in the way of, of, of tax revenue, which why the idea of of legalizing and taxing drugs to me is is kind of comical, frankly, um, on its face. Not to mention the, the health impacts and everything else. But you, know, you have really smart people that come, have come back and agree with you, Javier, without a doubt. Um, the system itself. There are so many entrenched interests, and consider again whatever we do to help you know, this unintended consequences of, of, of policy actions by the government uh, are, are, are going are gonna to ripple through the uh, ripple through those economies as well. Thanks a lot. So I guess we have something like 25 minutes. Uh, uh, and uh, I, I have uh, two pleas for my friends in the room. Uh, the, the first is to uh, let us know who you are. And the, the second is uh, uh, no speeches, please. Uh, I, I don't have good social skills, so I will rudely interrupt after a couple or a few minutes of speech. Um, I, I, I saw the gentleman in the, in the front first, and then we'll come to you, and, and please, uh, and, then, uh, and then third, and, and, and think about what you'd like to ask these guys in the meanwhile. Please. Uh, thank you. This has been a truly excellent uh, conversation. My name is Dan Schneider. I, speak at, I teach at American University School of International Service, and I can work on an a NIJ research grant involving U.S.-Mexico cooperation when it comes to fighting organized crime for the past three years. Uh, two brief comments I'd like you to respond to. Uh, one is uh, we have to start with the premise that most narcotics are, are uh, inelastic, right? That is, you can change demand, uh, supply all you want, uh, but, but the de uh, let's change supply all you want, but the demand pretty much stays the same. So the metric of using how many he hectares were eradicated or degraded as long as the profit margin remains significant, it really doesn't matter. That's one, I would like to respond to that. The second uh, comment has to do with product displacement. You can also eradicate a whole lot of cocaine, but as we've seen recently in the United States, there's a real shift in demand to, to heroin or, and meth, which does not get reported significantly in the United States, because mostly it wreaks its devastation in rural areas. So you also get product displacement, so it seems that the conversation has to include these two important uh, 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 findings or, or truths. Well, if I might, I, I, this is, Thank you I've very been much. dealing with these for a long time. The demand for uh, addictive substances is inelastic, but that's not to say zero elasticity. A typical uh, estimate is that the demand for cocaine has a price elasticity of about 0.5. So a 10% increase in price will lead to a 5% decrease in, in consumption. That's, I mean, so changes in supply can have real effect, uh, that shift the price can have real effects. Um, your second point about product displacement goes to a sort of odd phenomenon, which is the conservatism of the drug mar of drug users, or at least of addictive drug users. I mean, the world is full of interesting psychoactive substances. And they're still <laughs> using cocaine, heroin, marijuana, and methamphetamine. Get over it. I mean, so, you know, there, you'd think that there'd be simple product displacement. What's the difference between heroin and morphine and codeine? Apparently, it matters. So the one time there was a really big reduction in heroin availability in this country in the mid-70s, um, there was minimal displacement by heroin users to other kinds, they traded down to alcohol. And when heroin came back, they went back to heroin. Um, this surprising lack of substitution, and I don't, I mean, I, I find it odd and I don't take it to be a, an eternal truth, but as a matter of observation, mm -hmm. um, there's not a lot of, of Daniel had a thought. Yeah, you, you brought up economics into the question, so. But even if it's not a zero elasticity, 
when you decrease supply, you increase market trends because prices go up more than quantities go down. And that's the main, I, in my view, from on what I've, we've been doing in Colombia and Mexico, quantifying drug-related violence, that's the main driver of violence, market trends. What made Pablo Escobar rich? The fact that producing a gram of cocaine in the jungle of Colombia cost him $2.5, $2.5 or $3. And that gram put into the US markets or European markets costs anything between $120 and $200. And it's prohibition based. Uh, all the most of the price increase is due to the risk of taking this drug into the mm -hmm. into consumer markets. So the worst that can happen to Mexican cartels or to <coughs> Colombian cartels is bringing the price down. And supply reduction efforts haven't bring down prices. We'll, we'll move on, please. Um, my name is Carlos Indacoche. I used to teach. I'm a sociologist and political scientist. I'm puzzled by uh, something uh, um, that ought to be the elephant in the room. Um, it is very clear that the successful trafficker doesn't like drugs. The trafficker likes money, right? And the money is not realized as a profit until it's laundered. Now, we get a lot of news about laundering in Venezuela, Colombia, Brazil, Peru, <coughs> Bolivia, et cetera. Not many about laundering in the United States. And if I follow, Daniel, your line of, of description here, most of the profits are realized in the United States. We're talking about hundreds of billions of dollars laundered every year. But there's no focus on that. And that is the real fuel of the whole trafficking operation. I don't understand. Thank you. Thoughts on money laundering? OK. Yeah. I'm sorry to, to lead again, but I do is very much what I work on nowadays. Um, the, most, of the pro, most of the revenues from drug trafficking are earned by people at the bottom of the system. They are not earning monies that are not earning enough money to need to launder anything. Laundering is only needed for um, high level traffickers. And so you're talking about at best, the low tens of billions. And not clear how much of that is laundered. Well, anyway, so much of that is laundered in, indeed in the US and, and elsewhere, and in, and in Europe. Um, and it's interesting, I've just, I'm just finishing a paper. Sorry, this goes on a little bit, but um, Dutch. Uh, in, in the Netherlands, which is an entry point for cocaine, um, smugglers pay over 10% to just get their money out of the Netherlands back to Colombia in 500 euro notes. So that's a sort of success story for efforts to control money laundering. You do not want your money in the Netherlands, you want to get it back to, you know, sort of low-risk countries like Colombia and Peru, etc. So I, I think money laundering works works well in the sense that the money laundering controls work well in the sense that they make laundering money expensive, and that's probably as much as we can ask. Just Please go ahead. Yeah, yeah, a comment on that, and I'm going to I'm going to jump back to you, to you as well, just just briefly. But you know, just just as a data point, we do anti money laundering programs everywhere. Uh, we even met with the president of Panama just two weeks ago and sat down with him and talked about some treasury assistance uh, because of uh, a possible gray listing uh, of that country where they where they were found deficient in certain areas. So we take it very seriously, and, and certainly you know you follow the money. Uh, and and uh, you really do hurt, hurt organizations, and that's why I, I agree on the um, on the interdiction piece. If we could take out the big drug processing facilities rather than hurt the campesino, we'd have a bigger impact overall. Um, and just one point, it's not exactly germane to what you're talking about, but I, what I do think it's important to say and say publicly, and I, and, I, and I firmly believe this as well, which is has a benefit, I think, of, of being true. Um, the reason the FARC are negotiating for peace is because we fundamentally undercut their profits uh, from the cocaine trade. I still point to the fact that 50% of cocaine, there's a 50% reduction in coca cultivation in the country. 80% of coca has some tie into the FARC. 
the FARC aren't really horizontally integrated and vertically integrated, so they're not they're not exporting it. You still have big rents being being taken in by drug trafficking organizations, mostly from Mexico. Um, but the FARC themselves felt the pinch. That, and there are many other reasons as well. I mean, it's three percent approval rating and everything else. But the fact that we had an impact, and I do believe that this had an impact, to get an organization that's been in the field for 52 years or 53 years now, whatever it is. Um, killing innocent Colombians, I think, is something that, in and of itself, was a positive outcome. Daniel? I fully agree with you. And this is a reason that has been neglected in the, around the peace process. Why did FARC sit down in the table? I think it's the 55% decline in the amount of resources that they were getting out of the drug trade. Mm -hmm. Our estimates indicate that in 2008, they were getting about 13 about half of the total income, which was about $3.5 billion per year, and now they are getting less than $1 billion per year uh, in the dr from drug trafficking. Mm -hmm. they, have, they have managed to, to migrate into illegal gold mining, ex more extortion, mm -hmm. but if they were not doing it to start with, it's because it's less profitable. They have been able to counteract a little bit this, yeah. but, but I fully agree with you that one of the main reasons why FARC is sitting in, in Havana is because of the decrease in the amount of rents that they were getting from the drug traffic. Javier, please. I think to be honest with you, we don't know <laughs> what is the effect of these policies, if they manage actually to reduce or increase violence among criminal organizations, if uh, tracking down their money is actually hurting them. We don't know that um, mm. because we don't have much of the data. Sometimes government agencies do. In the case of the Mexican government, I know they just have a handful of people trying to, to track and do data mining or thousands of thousands of daily operations, uh, banking operations, and they just cannot keep with it. Um, so we don't know. We don't have the data to actually provide a solid answer. I will say, let's give uh, money laundering policies a chance to see, to compare how effective they are in terms of reducing violence uh, compared to arrests or all the way to the more violent actions of taking all the military out. Maybe it's gonna be more efficient putting people in the uh, finance ministries uh, that will be not shooting guns, but just tracking numbers and closing those venues of, of, of revenues. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. This lady has been waiting. Hi, Catherine Johnson, Guadalajara, New Mexico. And thank you very much for addressing this issue. It's obviously one that's really important to us. Um, I do want to take a moment, specifically though, to meet the families in saying that there's no direct impact of interdiction. Um, we They, they, they use these attitudes, and it's how we work in the cartels, when we talk about the human rights of traffickers, they use that sort of rhetoric and that attitude to call whoever they don't like traffickers. So how do we really know what the impact, the direct impact of interdiction are when we're working with governments that, that use those sorts of things? Okay, let me clarify this. Um, I, I said this from the Colombian point of view, I, I, and I did, I did try to look for at least news pieces on, on violation of human rights of, of traffickers, of people trying to smuggle drugs or controlling uh, the labs, the HEL labs. And I didn't find anything, but maybe there are cases in other countries that where you have uh, causal links between interdiction efforts and, and human rights violations. I just said this for, Colum for the Colombian case. And I, I did ask people who, who work in the field, NGOs in Colombia, if, if I was right, and they never told me anything about that of a known human rights violations out of, of an interdiction program. But maybe for other countries there, there are, for sure. Please, so I, I see uh, four hands and we have 10 minutes, so that might all, almost exhaust us, so please be, be brief if you can. Thank you. It, right in front, please. This is Bloody Younger, it's Nicola Wola. I'll just yes. give the response to this name. Please. I think it depends on how you define an addiction then. I think if it's okay. a lot of law enforcement efforts, we do find it's been established. Mm -hmm. We find people arbitrarily detained, we find Torture, and of course, there's the whole problem that hasn't been addressed in the context of this discussion here of the unintended consequence of the humanitarian crisis in the region of jails, which have been filled with low-level, nonviolent drug offenders mm -hmm. who are serving disproportionately high sentences. I could go on at length about this, but I won't. But I just wanted to put that out there. 
It, 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 I'm going to, you know, I shouldn't jump in the middle of this because y'all should be focusing these questions at me. So, Danielle, thank you very much for taking the bullet today. Um, so, so I'm intimately uh, involved and engaged on, on some of the scenes that you, that you mentioned as well. It, you know, it, it is really interesting. There, there are definitely there are issues with pretrial detention and the, and the Bartolinas in these countries. Then the question there is people who have either not, never seen a judge or have served a sentence they would have served had they seen a judge and they're still incarcerated. And, and there's some significant questions behind, okay, you know, we're working with our judicial systems. Where are, those pe where are those people gonna go if they get out? I mean, I think they should be out, right? I mean, they've served a sentence uh, uh, and, and what have you. There's gonna be a, there, there's gonna be a, a, a significant um, impact to local communities uh, when, those folks, when those folks get out. An unintended consequence, if you will. The fact that, for instance, if we use cell phone blockers uh, in certain jails, that could directly lead to increases of violence on the street. There's a great article in the Atlantic Monthly uh, talking about how gangs in U.S. jails keep down violence. It, you know, it, it, fascinating stuff. And I think all these, all these things point to thinking through uh, the consequences of our, our policies and actions. I would submit that if we're working with security forces in Central America particular, particularly, where we're doing Leahy vetting and we're providing human rights training and we're doing the types of things that they wouldn't be getting otherwise, that's a better result than if we weren't involved at all. Thank you very much. So I, I saw three of you all together, and what, what I suggest is, uh, if you don't mind, passing the mic among yourselves and, and, and say, let's have all three at once, and then maybe we can conclude. Thank you. I'm Lisa Jacobson. I work with Search for Common Ground. Um, I just had a question. I know in the last couple of years, kind of fighting organized crime in the US, look to imprison violent offenders, and then eventually most of them do get deported back to their countries. Um, I was curious if you could comment on that and the increase in violence and obviously organized crimes in the countries now as a relation to that. Thank you. Hi, Heather Stewart with NAFSA, the Association of International Educators. There was one mention of the DREAM Act and another mention about immigration and our inability to deal with immigration reform in this country. And one aspect of the balloon effect and the whack-a-mole effect is people come to the United States because of some of our policies that we have uh, that impact uh, Central America. And we saw this uh, with the great increase in unaccompanied <laughs> minor children and women coming across the border. And there's a lack of discussion in the press and I think in, po in the policy realm of how our demand, the US demand for drugs fueling violence and criminality in Central America thus impacts um, uh, immigration to the United States and and how it all feeds together so I wondered if someone could comment to that thank you thank you what, one more please and then I'll, I'll, I'll uh, come to our panel <laughs> thank Thanks. you um, Alexis Valdovinos UNDP intern and uh, graduate student at GW uh, I just had a, a quick just a quick comment on the uh, idea of a plan on Duras I know you guys were talking about that a little bit but I was just wondering whether or not the United States is looking at different policies or alternative policies to something like that. I understand Plan Colombia was worked in very particular manners, but I hope the United States is having a better idea than to just kind of transfer those that type of policy into something as complex as Honduras and something as complex as narco trafficking in Central America. And then whether or not we're taking some of the more alternative policies like the ones that are being enacted in Uruguay more seriously now that we're cons now that we're looking at impasses. Thank you so much. So th thoughts on migration, lessons from Uruguay, I'm other topics? You are the experts on migration. I, 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 the, the people are here to, to hear you guys. <laughs> but, uh, please. Go um, ahead, Peter. I'm answered enough. Uh, I, I mean, I, I'll try to be very brief, and apology, apologies for leading again. I, I'm going to hit all three of them quickly. Uh, the first, it, it might surprise you all to know that we were deporting people in the United States without giving their complete criminal histories. Uh, I think we had a significant problem, and actually, I, when I over the course of the last year, I've worked very closely in my office with the Department of Homeland Security uh, to provide information, a criminal history information sharing system to Central America and some countries in, uh, in the Caribbean, which is being rolled out um, in, in the hopes that they can deal with that issue. Um, speaking about domestic policies that that on, on deporting people, I mean that's that's well beyond my my pay grade and my and my bailiwick. On the other two issues, Plan Honduras new policies, most, most assuredly, we are talking about new policies. We're talking about Plan Central America. We're trying to integrate the countries. And we're really, what we're talking about is, again, uh, a Central America that is democratic, middle class, and secure. And we have to think about things a little more holistically. I'm not just out building 
vetted units and having DEA fast teams jump out of helicopters while that may happen. What we are doing instead is focused on how do we get community policing? How do we give people, how do we get people to buy into their own government? I think it's fundamental. We have to do that. We have to create that connection. You know, I learned that in Afghanistan. I certainly learned it in Colombia, and we need to put it into practice in Central America. And finally, I think it's much more complex than just the demand for drugs in the United States, which, by the way, the demand for cocaine is down 50% since 2007 in the United States. Displacement effects and everything. Cocaine users don't use meth. You know, it's just not cool, right? I mean, they don't. I mean, generally speaking, I, I don't have the numbers. I'm sure Peter does. But um, the fact of the matter is these, these gangs and criminal organizations that are, that are operating uh, many times, in the case of Guatemala, they prefer to operate out of jail because jail is a safe place for them. They can operate from there and be relatively safe. Um, it's all about micro extortion. Uh, we've set up vetted units and task forces to get after uh, transportation extortion, small business extortion. If you sell a pupusa in El Salvador, you're paying somebody vacuna. And we have to get after that because that person is sitting there going, what's government doing for me? Um, so it, it, it's a very complex issue. Yeah. Javier. I think we can, the migration has two different uh, paths. It's not only Central or Latin American countries in general expelling labor to the U.S., but at the same time, the U.S. is actually sending many of these people back. Mm -hmm. We saw that in the 80s with massive deportation of uh, Central Americans then going back to their uh, countries. And that was the beginning of the transportation of these L.A. gang style organizations that were transplanted into Central America, which is now the root of the core, the, the core root of the problem there. Uh, we learn from that experience and the consequences of these long-term uh, U.S. policies. Uh, we can start be questioning about the effect of uh, deportations back to Mexico, which, which are now reaching a negative uh, uh, rate. There's been massive amounts of the deportations back to Mexico. What's going to happen in two generations down the road of that? Probably we're going to see new different types of criminal organizations that learn some new uh, things or new techniques in the U.S. and now are going to be implemented in Mexico to increase the fuel in the environment there. And you get domestic policy in Mexico. I was in Tapachula on the border of Guatemala, mm -hmm. where I think about 58,000 Central Americans were deported from Mexico back to Central America, which is down. which is, is rolls down. That also is going to have an impact. Mm -hmm. uh, closing thoughts, Peter. Anya. So there's much that the U.S. should be feel guilty about, but actually, <laughs> I don't think that Honduran violence is really one for which we have a major responsibility. I think it's been worsened both by the deportations, though you know, the deportations don't seem to me unreasonable in the sense that uh, these are, many of these are people who cause serious problems here. Um, they don't have a right to stay here. That's, that's not unreasonable. Send them back. It has worsened the problem. And drug trafficking to feed the U.S. market is a minor factor in Honduras. I mean, I, I don't gain great expertise about Honduras, but that seems to be a consensus amongst those who do work on it. Uh, the violence has, uh, the gang violence there has really a domestic origin, and we need to help Honduras deal with it as best we can, if we can, um, but I don't think that that is, uh, the, the, the children who are fleeing that violence uh, are fleeing something, a problem for which we only have a modest share of the responsibility for what that's worth. Any other new last words? Uh, it's time to wrap up. I, I would like, uh, uh, it, it, to the extent that you have a few minutes, if you could hang around, I'm sure there are people who all want to talk to you if you need to go. That's, uh, of course, that's understandable. Thank you all very much for coming. I, I really want to thank Cynthia, who's standing right there, who worked for weeks to put this event uh, together, and uh, Amanda Glassman with Diana Rojas Suarez were also very uh, uh, helpful. And of course, Amanda, our events coordinator, who put this together, is just, uh, it's, it's, it's terrific stuff. Uh, please stay in touch with Beyond the Fence. Uh, uh, if you're interested in knowing about future events, uh, talk to Cynthia afterwards. We can get you on an email list and also go to this website, subscribe to our Twitter feed, and you'll know everything that we're doing. And uh, uh, please help me thank these guys.